and then now it's about 21 million so what this is basically saying there's 21 million people claiming that they're jobless uh, from March which is just nuts 21 million people claiming jobless Okie dokie, thanks for joining us all, um, or me, here today. And what I want to do is talk about um, a thing which I think is needed, um, and it's what I've called the Macrometrics Dashboard, because everyone seems to think that the property market and stock market is the, is the economy. They, they look at rising stock market and they think, oh, the economy is doing great, but it isn't. It's, it, it, <laughs> it really isn't. Um, it's... Yeah, as I keep on saying, like if if someone gets shot in the gut or just shot with a bullet, full stop, um, it's not good. And then you go to hospital because and they pump you full of morphine, uh, and of course you're going to feel high and happy. Um, and so happiness is not an indicator of your health at that point in time when you have gastric juices flowing all around your body. Um, so yeah, you have to understand that the stock market and property market are vanity bleh, vanity metrics. Um, and so we have to distinguish the difference between the health metrics, so the mac, you know, the macro metrics in terms of health metrics, and the central bank levers or levers. Uh, a lot of people seem to focus on the levers, and so what a central bank effectively does, they got two main levers, really. Um, one is to print more currency, um, and the other one is to um, drop rates. So th they're the two main things. And the, the third sort of caveat one is open liquidity lines or lines of credit. So that, that sort of comes under the print more currency thing. So they can either literally print more currency, um, well, buy more bonds, um, or government buy more treasury notes, etc. Um, and at the same time, they can go, right, we are opening up a basically a, a credit line which people can draw from. So they're, they're the same things. And so if you look over here on the left, we zoom into this one. So this is just the monetary base. Um, so this is pretty much hard cash in the US. Um, you can see that from it, during 2000, from 2009, when they started the first form of QE with the plunge protection team, um, up until about 2012, they printed effectively just, uh, just over two trillion, um, yeah, two trillion dollars. Well, look what's happened with, since this corona debacle. We have literally printed um, roughly the same amount in the last couple of months than we did from 2009 to 2012. It's been absolutely crazy. And that's just base money. And then when you look at M2, um, you can see it's a lot more. So this little uptick is just an hors d'oeuvre. This is just the first of much more to come. We haven't experienced helicopter money just yet. So, and you'll probably notice that I'm focusing a lot on the US today, and that's because when the US sneezes, the world catches Ebola. Um, so, we, yeah, um, it, it affects everyone, it really does. And so dropping rates, as you can see, rates, uh, they, they dropped them massively during the um, subprime mortgage collapse. Well, guess what? We are now back to those lows. We are at pretty much 0%, um, and I won't be surprised if they um, if we see negative rates and basically the the two main levers that they use to try and help the economy or help the stock market back in 08 was basically print more currency and drop rates well as you can see they dropped the rates they they're around five percent and they dropped them to zero well now they can't really drop them they're already at zero and they've already printed currency into oblivion so eventually yeah they can print another 10 trillion 20 trillion etc but at some point confidence in the dollar will disappear and that's when the stimulus won't touch the sides it, it just won't it won't matter it'll become worthless uh well it's already worthless pretty much but um and yeah we're entering what japan did in the 1990s um japan what japan has shown everyone is that you can print your currency into oblivion you can have qe infinity uh and still keep the show going um i mean they've been yeah, so they are well above 200% of uh, debt to GDP and they're still going. So I think a lot of policymakers in the Western world are going, oh, okay, we can kick the can down the road. Um, I'm only in office for another f four years, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and so that's, yeah, it's, it's a big hot potato that they're all passing around and kicking down the road. So here are the health indicators, I guess, in my personal opinion. Uh, we have the currency, velocity, debt, 
GDP and growth, uh, purchase managers index, uh, delinquencies, bankrupts, and unemployment. They're the real things. That's you know, that's your blood pressure, so to speak. And uh, in fact, I don't know anything about medicine, so <laughs> I need to stop making medical analogies. So yeah, let's let's just look at the first one, which is currency velocity. So um, it's all very well printing as much currency as you want, but it's completely ab re like redundant unless there's velocity. So if there's no velocity, let's let's say for example velocity is zero, you could print a hundred trillion dollars and it won't do anything because that 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 hundred trillion dollars is not moving, it's not going anywhere. So the velocity of currency is far more important than how much currency there is. So the reason they drop interest rates is because they, what they want to do is they're they're basically putting the foot down on the accelerator in the car and they want the car to go faster. And so by dropping rates what what's happening is that they're hoping people lend more people borrow more people can take more risks they're like oh okay i can borrow more money to grow my business employ more staff etc so i you know and, and the risk is relatively low to borrow um so that's why they drop rates um but guess what they've been dropping rates for well best part of <laughs> 20 odd years 20 well so if you look at this the velocity of a currency has been dropping massively um, since the late 90s and it has yeah and every crash we've had re since then the 2001 crash and especially 2008 we had basically everything grinding to a, a standstill and nothing has changed the velocity is just is, is capitulating and they're doing all of these measures um, to try and prop up the currency so in fact if we zoom out and go back to let's just copy this probably should have put it next to this but you can see if you were to superimpose this, that th they know that this is happening and th the velocity is, is falling off a cliff. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to compensate the loss of velocity by continually increasing more currency. And now they've gone into overdrive and this, yeah, this is, um, is, is interesting. But basically, if the, if the currency is not sloshing around the economy, no one's doing anything. There's no growth. So that's the velocity. I think this is probably one of the most important charts that you'll see today. Um, and not many people talk about that. Uh, so this is something which I, um, I keep an eye on. So now we have to look at debt. Again, I'm abbreviating a lot today because this. I, what I don't want is this to go on for an hour and a half. Um, I want to keep this as quick as possible. But when we're looking at debt, as you know, there's all sorts of debt bubbles. We have the auto uh, back security debts. We've got student loan debt. We've got um, private medical debt. There's all sorts of things which are in a bubble right now. Um, but when you're looking at this, so most I, I've taken all these stats from Macro Trends or the Federal Reserve's website. So you, no one can accuse me of you know being very favourable um, or selective with the data I'm using. I'm just using official stats. Um, so here is a total public debt as a percentage of the US GDP. So at the moment we can see they started spending their way out of the subprime mortgage collapse. Uh, and guess what? We're in this lovely, what looks like a bullish rectangle on debt to GDP. Um, and so, yeah, we're above 100%. So debt is more than the GDP, um, which is, yeah. And, and this is only going to accelerate. We'll come back to this, but you'll see the debt is rapidly accelerating. What's happening to GDP? Ah, oh, actually it's gone up. So that's interesting. So a few days ago, as you probably saw in, the, in some videos, that GDP was um, <coughs> get, were, well, yeah, it was going down quite fast. But I think here we've got some weird disconnect. So this is I, what I'm pretty sure is pretty misleading because look, when you have tax revenue, which is roughly 70% of the US economy, tax revenue is falling off a cliff um, and it is still falling. But suppose but for somehow GDP is going up so I'm not sure what's happening there that was going down yesterday when I made this this uh, presentation so um, I have to do a little look see on what's going on there but as you can see debt is outpacing GDP so but yeah this this could probably most likely be the the stock market um, rally that we had recently but we'll see anyway um, moving on I'm just gonna mute everyone again just to get rid of that background noise so yeah, this this is going to continue to shoot up. It's just an, an inevitability. Um, oh, in fact, it brings me to the debt clock again. <laughs> um, so th this is interesting. So yesterday, as you can see here, uh, well, the 10th, oh no, this was two days ago. So the 10th of June at about half, what was that? 
half four. Sorry, I could have just zoomed in. I was trying to crank my neck in to see that. Um, you can see that the national debt was 25 0.9 trillion, what's it today? It's 26, it's gone past, yeah, we've just breached that 26 trillion level. Uh, what else was there? So um, federal tax revenue, so basically the US income, which is their main income, 3.2 trillion, um, or in fact, these such big numbers. You can see it has fallen a fair bit. It's fallen, what, a billion? So what was that one? A trillion, oh Jesus Christ, there's too many zeros. Um, yeah, it's fallen roughly a billion dollars. And tax revenue's gone up. Uh, sorry, um, GDP's gone up, which is interesting. But as I said, I'll look at that later. So, yeah, US debt clock, if you're ever interested. It's, it's fascinating. And there's all sorts of different stats on that site. And so when we're looking at non-financial corporate debt, so this is basically corporate debt, so big companies, but not banks, uh, or basically, basically non-financial. Um, we, we tend to see GDP as a percentage, sorry, debt as a percentage of GDP gets to certain highs, then we tend to see uh, collapses. So pretty much every time we have a spike in non-financial corporate debt, uh, we have a recession. These, these red lines are a recession. So we have the Soviet crash, effectively the Soviet Union collapsing, uh, the tech bubble crash, subprime mortgage co collapse, and now this, I believe, will be the everything collapse, um, where we have all sorts of debt bub uh, doubles, um, all frothing and popping uh, slowly or some of them are slowly deflating but um yeah it, it's going to cause all sorts but I, I i would say there's a very low risk high probability outcome play here that the, we're, we're going to see another deep depression um and well, in fact it <laughs> if you hopefully by the end of this video you'll see that it's we we 100 percent will be entering a depression a depression, not recession, a depression. So, you know, most people say depression is two recessions back to back, but it's going to be a lot worse than that. So, so that's the debt. I haven't really focused too much on the debt. Let's have a look at GDP and SME growth. So when we're looking at uh, GDP, so first of all, I'm not a fan of the, the, the metric of GDP. Um, it's, it's a metric which sort of yeah, Easter Island, as I've said before, is the best example of that. It's a tiny island. Um, they were obsessed with GDP, and their main GDP, their their main product was selling timber, uh, and their whole island was full of trees. And so, what they did is, is they chopped down all of their trees in order to keep on growing their GDP. And then, guess what? They had soil erosion because the root system disappeared, and they had like a ninety percent um, uh, population cull because. Um, they couldn't grow crops that you know and so load like most they decimated their population because they're chasing this silly carrot which is gdp anywho looking at us gdp because it seems to be the altar that every wall street uh, fanboy uh, worships look at 2012 right now you can see gdp has been you know growing over the years um but we've just had a big big dip um, and this is we haven't even finished 2020 yet um, and if you look at most crashes where you have a big dip in the beginning of the year, most of the time, the end of the year, we, it ends up a lot worse. So I'm getting ready for sort of October time. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. So this is this is time. Yeah, I think we're going to see much more more falling. And, and I think that it's going to be, you know, like this and then like this and then like this, etc. So I, I, what I don't see is, you know, this happening. I just can't see it, especially when the whole world has basically been locked down and cut off and businesses are going bust. What, apparently one in four restaurants will never reopen. Um, it's a total shit show. <clears throat> um, and looking at this, so this was again two days ago, um, looking at that debt clock. If you go back to here and look at world debt clocks, it basically shows you the same thing. So um, other than the US going up with the GDP, uh, everyone else is plummeting. So this is what it looked like the other day. Um, GDP was plummeting, national debt was going up. Um, and what does it look like? Yeah, in fact, there's no point comparing. You, it's, the, the numbers are too big, it's hard to understand. Um, but yeah, you, you get you get the picture. Again, looking at US corporate profits. So when I say corporate, so these are the real big boys. These are the, you know, the massive companies that you're all familiar with. Um, <clears throat> just like 2008, uh, we're having another dip in profits, and I think this is just the 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 hors d'oeuvre of what's to come. And yeah, uh, 
what is yeah so looking at nano businesses like or nano micro small and medium businesses how are they doing like i couldn't really find that many good stats or charts i think it's too early to tell um I suppose now now I think of it I could look at sort of bankruptcy chapter 11 filings etc but um it's not healthy um, every business person I know um, is suffering in some way or another I'm suffering in some parts of the businesses and some businesses are doing all right but most people are in pain um, and I think what's happening is that the governments around the world have quickly issued out plasters <laughs> you know with all these grants and furloughing schemes etc they're just plasters um, and it's not going to really um, bring back a lot of the businesses like I've got a, a retail business which is totally screwed it's like a spa like like I'm paying I'm still have to pay rent on the premises because the landlord obviously won't budge um, and obviously and it's obvious why the landlord won't budge because that is his income stream um, so I'm paying rent etc for a business which has been forced to shut down I'm not allowed to open it till the 4th of July um, and yeah so revenues dropped off a cliff so yeah I've got some grants but psh, um, it doesn't really cut the mustard um, and also with all of the furloughing schemes out there, uh, it's not just the UK doing it, there are, there are other countries doing it. Um, like a lot of businesses are now realizing that they can run their business a lot meaner and leaner with, i.e. with less staff. Um, and so when the furloughing scheme ends, I think a lot of people are gonna go, um, lose their jobs, a lot of people. Um, and unfortunately in my group, we're going to lose we're going to have to lose about 15 people in, in the whole group of businesses, which is really sad. And so I guess we, I mean, in my isolated case, we're just waiting till, what is it, September when it ends? Um, so yeah, I, I just think it's, it's a total clusterfuck uh, mess um, <laughs> with, with the small businesses. And these are the backbone of every nation. So here, oh, yeah, so this is interesting. This is uh, an excerpt from my book, The 15 Grand Pop Tart, which I wrote in like 2013. It was, ridiculous. It was a long time ago. Um, and I thought, oh, interesting. So this is this happened a long time ago. So basically, uh, recently, US GDP calculations have changed. They're now including research R&D spending as part of their GDP. Now, this is absurd. The US spends more on military R&D than every country in the world combined. Even their medicine R&D dwarfs other nations. Now it could be argued that medicine R and D could be more uh, could produce more efficient medicines, which would positively bring in more uh, bring more revenue in. I'm, I struggle to read, um, but it's negligible. Uh, military R and D has next to no productive use other than for war, and so this ploy is something which will make the U.S. debt to GDP ratio not look as bad as it really is. So that's the key thing here. Um, GD, debt to GDP is falling through the roof, or falling through the floor, sorry. And so they wanted to try and tart it up. They wanted some lipstick to make it look prettier. And what they did is they, they just, oh, uh, we spend trillions a year on uh, on uh, military. Let's add that to GDP. So in fact, yeah, that GDP boost could be, uh, pff, I don't know. Um, so yeah, they're the only country in the world to do this, but it probably won't be long before the UK follows suit in order to hide our problems. Also, GDP is an extremely flawed concept designed for the World War II era, and I could talk for a week on this, why the stat is harming the world. So hopefully you can understand that the GDP that you're seeing in the US is really shit. <laughs> it's just, yeah, and, and I'm not sure which how, how many other nations have the same sort of, um, yeah, uh, rubbish. So this is an interesting article that I saw that popped up. So let's just, whoopsie, Daisy, let's open this. So this is from this morning. This just popped up literally a few, um, half an hour ago. Basically, yeah, even, um, I don't read the news, but it just Google seemed to serve it to me. Um, Bank of England warns of the worst recession in the last 300 years. Um, outputs. Uh, now, it be, there's lots of different forms of output, so I'm not sure what it's classing as output here, but a 30% drop in output is pretty big, regardless of what metric it's using. So, uh, long story short, it's, it's it's saying it's gonna be as, as bad as the Great Frost of 1709. But here's the thing, um, they, yeah, Mr. Bailey and all the other people, they're saying, um, yeah, the better path is for banks to keep on lending. And we keep banging this message home. <laughs> Literally, that's all that bankers know how to do. 
shit hits the fan. Oh, let's just print. We don't know what else to do. Um, so I guess, yeah, this it, it's just pretty dire. Um, so yeah, that's that. Now, where does this take us back into our spider web? Let's get back to so that's GDP done. Let's now look at PMI, the Purchasing Managers Index. So let's have a quick, let's zoom into the proper right, aspect ratio. So 100%, here we go. So I'm going to read this. Uh, the Purchasing Managers, so this is from Investopedia. So this is the official term. Um, the PMI is an index of the prevailing direction of economic trends in the manufacturing and se service sectors. It consists of a diffusion index uh, that summarizes whether market conditions as viewed by purchasing managers are expanding, staying the same or contracting. The purpose of the PMI is to provide information about current and future business conditions uh, to company decision makers, analysts and investors. Wordy. Simple Siam English is basically are big companies that build and make stuff buying stuff for growth slash manufacture. That's pretty much as basic as you can make it. Are big companies buying stuff because if they are, it means they're making, they're, they're selling stuff. If big companies are not selling stuff, guess what? PMI goes down. Um, so just quickly in the chat box, does that make does, does that make sense with the PMI? I'll, I'll say that again. If big companies are selling stuff, it means they need stuff to build that stuff. If if sales drop off a cliff, PMI index goes down. So for me, it's a massive canary in the coal mine. Cool. Okay, this makes sense. Nice. So for, yeah, so this is I guess make when, when yeah manufacturer industry type canary in the coal mine. If this PMI goes down, everyone's screwed. So let's look at China. China is the is the country that makes everything. So obviously we had a massive spike down with the whole Corona panic. Now China supposedly have recovered, and as we can see the PMI. So yeah, th so this chart isn't as bad as it um, as as it looks. Basically, it's, it's showing us that, yeah, it, they had a bit of a scare and it sort of bounced back. Now, will this continue? I don't know. Um, we don't know. It's promising that it has bounced back. It means that China is trying to f uh, fire on all cylinders again, but China isn't the only place that makes stuff. Look at the US. The US did not bounce back. Um, and I think it's because, yeah, it, yeah, I think it's bounced back because people still need stuff we're still consuming stuff yes it's at a far lower rate than it ever has been um but china builds stuff and makes stuff and sells stuff a lot cheaper than everyone everyone else so that's why i think they bounce back whereas us no um those pesky unions and stuff china doesn't have any of that so <laughs> um yeah so the us is still a big um producer and yeah they haven't bounced back the euro pmi has basically been falling since 2018 um, ever since you you know been going through the brexit stuff um, I don't think that will recover <clears throat> I still think the euro will break up I think we'll have some sort of frexit grexit all sorts of you know italics it or whatever you want to call it uh, Japan they're a big producer of electronics predominantly they're still falling um, and then yeah here, here's here's a key thing China retails Chinese retails China retail sales year on year so everything is going down now I'm showing you a lot of charts today and if there's anyone here new that's not familiar with finance etc it doesn't really matter all you need to understand is typically when you're looking at a chart when anything goes go da 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 that's bad right and if anything does this that's good well unless that's you know unemployment <laughs> rising unemployment is not bad but yeah down you know, the severity of the chart is all you really need to understand it, and most of these charts that you're seeing are vertical um, it, it, either up or down um, so this is basically um, year on year of, of, of the main provinces in China and uh, it, it, it's just not good um, so yeah and it, it's falling into the, ne the, ne the, ne the, the negative can't talk today um, this is auto. Oh shit! I forgot to include the. So this is something to do with the auto data. So I think this is car sales in the U.S. So I should. Have, I forgot to put the label in there. Car sales in the U.S. So yeah, and as you can see, that's plummeting. Um, and this is U.S. car sales. Um, yeah, U.S. Ah, okay, I, I see what's happened here. So I, I moved a whole bunch of things around. So U.S. So this was U.S. industrial production. Wait a minute. 
No, so it's the other way around. So this is US car sales up here. This makes more sense. Um, which is going down. And this is US industrial production. Uh, good night, America. Simple as that. It's just, especially with all these riots and stuff, it's only going to get worse. So yeah, that's PMI. It doesn't look good. Does not look good. Now we need to go into delinquencies and bankruptcies. I guess this is more of an effect. So all of, you know, currency velocity falling off the cliff, debt going up, GDP falling, PMI falling. They are, I guess, the real movers. They're the levers. They're the, they're the I guess, the real health metrics. And delinquencies and bankruptcies is, I guess, like a, an effect. It's what happens when all of this goes to pot. But when we're looking at delinquencies and bankruptcies, um, look at the US auto loans. So as I said, there's a subprime auto or so we had the subprime mortgage collapse in 2008. We have the same thing, but with auto loans. So we have a subprime auto back loan bubble at the moment. Um, and these are, yeah, loans more than 90 days delinquent. And that's rising. Um, because, yeah, when, when you're losing your income, like everyone is in the US pretty much, uh, well, not everyone, but a, a big percentage of them, um, you know, you, you, you use your money for food and, and, and essentials uh, and rent or hell people are foreclosing on their or neglecting their rent obligations and mortgage obligations as well so it's just not good um, as you can see uh, delinquency rate triples in US commercial mortgage market so this so commercial commercial mortgage market so this is mainly um, I guess offices shopping malls um, because everything is closed and shut down um, they're taking the brunt I mean hell I've got four commercial properties which I pay rent for and I still have to pay the freaking rent and I haven't defaulted on my rent obligations but I, I don't like it I've got an, an, a nice office in in the Norwich area um, it's not expensive it's only what 16 1700 pounds a month but it's an office I haven't touched since March um, and yeah I don't like yeah so everyone's screwed and the thing is we don't need it anymore we really don't so yeah and I've got lots of friends who are you know used to rent offices as well but now what they're doing is they're just building uh, an office in the garden they're just building a little pod in the garden um, and that will save their rent you know moving forward so and I think a lot of people are doing that um, yeah lots of businesses know realize they can operate with the staff at home yeah, biggest US mile is two months delinquent, um, massive loan um, delinquency there. So, yeah, and this is this is just for April and May, so this is gonna get worse. Um, so that's that. And here are some big businesses that have gone bust since sort of March. Um, a lot of these, are, I guess, American ones. Um, and these are massive ones, by the way. Uh, but the ones I've really highlighted, the one, I mean, Virgin Australia is is a very small entity, so I haven't really gone. Um, made too much of a deal and Intel sat as a big deal but Hertz, Debenhams, Monsoon, Victoria's Secret, Kath Kidston, Laura Ashley, Hawkins Bazaar, oh, Oasis like these are big companies that are going bust um, now when you we, what you have to understand for big companies going bust it doesn't mean that they're going to disappear disappear forever so what they there's, there's lots of different variants and forms of going bust when you're a big business but effectively what tends to happen it goes into administration um, and it's, I guess it's a shareholder changing. It's, it's a change of guards. It's like, okay, right, Hertz is going bust or gone bust. Um, and what happens is someone comes in. So the staff don't normally get affected too badly. Pension pots don't get affected. But someone else comes to save the day. Um, and then they reopen. And it's just the big boys at the top, the C-suite, that just you know get ousted after their big paydays. Um, Wee. So that's that. Uh, and this is interesting. So Hertz, Jesus Christ, Hertz is doing a masterclass on, on like what they what they're doing is doing um, an initial bankruptcy offering, which is I guess a new thing. Uh, What's well, new to me at least. Um, so instead of an IPO, initial public offering where companies growing, it's new and you know selling their shares to the public. Um, Hertz, the so the people managing Hertz, this bank, they're trying to do an initial bankruptcy offering. So what they're basically doing is like, like, so normally when a company goes bust, they, they sell off assets to try and pay their creditors, right? Um, because the company is a massive debtor. Um, but what they're doing is they're, they're like, oh, we got, how about we sell 
a whole bunch of our unused stock to the dumb idiot public to try and pay off our creditors. So yeah, uh, debtors now seek emergency relief from this court to allow the debtors to capture the potential value of unissued Hertz shares for the benefit of the debtors' estates. Uh, moreover, the stock issuance will carry no repayment obligations and the debtors will not pay any interest or fees to those to, who provide the funding by buying the shares, etc, etc. So what they're basically doing is they've got a whole bunch of shares which haven't been issued to the, to the public and they're just going to sell them to the public at fire sale rates, so really attractive rates or prices to try and turn it around. Uh, and as you can see, Twitter, uh, though, yeah, I have to say that I've never seen a debtor petition the court for permission to sell equity to idiots, uh, investors, while in bankruptcy. I mean, you would have to be an idiot to buy Hertz right now. You would have to be an idiot to buy travel stocks. Like, this is the new norm. Like, things are not resuming. Even if we all open up, if you look at the airways, uh, loads of airlines have had to just give up certain routes. Because you have to fly certain routes regularly to maintain that route. Otherwise, it's, but it's use it or lose it. So even if we do open up, it's going to be at a fraction of what it was pre, pre-March. pre um, You're playing with fire if you're buying any form of stocks or travel. Uh, sorry, um, tourism type stocks. Hertz is one of them. Yeah, I've never read anything more insane in the finance world. Um, hey, but yeah, we'll see what happens. I think we've had... In fact, I'm just curious. Let's have a look at Hertz. Let's get the chart. Um, with that is oh, hello Deutsche Bank um, Hertz here we go global holdings yeah this is going it doesn't look healthy guys it really doesn't <laughs> um, I would stay well away so Deutsche Bank is yeah so <laughs> um, my cat is called Coco right and I think Coco has a thing for me Either she's sizing me up to one day try and kill me and eat me, or she fancies me, I don't know. Um, but she's an old girl, and she stares at me from the, across the room, in every room. So here is a picture I took whilst I was washing up, doing the dishes, and tiny, as you can see, the kitchen's a tip. Um, and she's just staring at me. And she does it in the living room, or like, yeah, so she likes staring at me. <clears throat> and so I am Coco when it comes to certain stocks. And I'm like I'm like Coco right now, looking at Deutsche Bank. I have been for years, uh, but Deutsche Bank are screwed. I, I, I cannot. I've been saying this for years now. It, it, they will go go to zero. Um, so this is in 2019. They announced that they're going to cut 18,000 jobs. They haven't fully done that yet, um, but it looks like they're opening the tap again. As in, or oh, they're starting to get that that you know um, knife out. They're going to carry on cutting jobs, which isn't good. Um, and this is, yeah, this is Deutsche Bank on the weekly chart. As you can see, they've basically gone 100 from $140 down to $9. Uh, and it, it's it's game over. I, this, this will go to zero, or this will need bailing out. And this may be the... The black swan that kills, the, you know, is the final nail in the in the coffin that you know rolls over the markets eventually, and everyone will say, "Oh, it's a black swan, a major bank going bust." It's not a black swan. I've been chat, yeah. So just just be prepared, and I'm fully expecting big banks to go bust. Someone like Barclays, HSBC, yeah. HSBC Santander, one of the big banks will go bust. It will start off with a mortgage uh, or a property real estate based financial firm going bust. So I guess one of the main lenders will go bust, you know, of, of mortgages will go bust, I reckon. And that will be a big domino that will topple many other dominoes. Um, yeah. And also, <laughs> let's go, go again. Uh, General Motors. I It doesn't look good. There's all sorts of um, wire fraud, um, insurance fraud uh, investigations at the moment with General Motors. Have a look into it. But it doesn't look good good on just uh, uh, criminal stuff aside it doesn't look good they sold all of their european ops uh, not long ago um which they've been losing money for 14 years straight china flopped uh, they're getting hammered in china and it's just gloomy prospects so i think if i mean Gen general motors went bust in 2009 and it's likely they're going to go do the same again because nothing has changed so when you're looking at their this is revenue since 2010 it jumped up a bit, but it's been down ever since to to well, back end of two, 2013, um, and so yeah, and and guess what? 
Tesla is destroying the US car market. They are absolutely gobbling it, it up. So this is, yeah, this is Tesla from 2010 to now. It's just up in terms of revenue. Um, <clears throat> just had a quick question from Wayne Oss or what, yeah. Um, on that note, which do you think are the safer of the UK banks? I haven't got a clue. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I think, actually, I, I wouldn't worry too much because I think, as I said in other videos, I think what the government will do this time around is they'll let the big banks go bust this time. I think there'll be absolute carnage on the streets if the government bails out the banks again. So I don't think they'll do that. Um, <clears throat> I think they'll let them go bust and they'll use this as a really convenient excuse to, to roll out the digital sterling. Um, I've talked about this before again, but I know many times, but um, they'll, yeah, if you've got 10 grand in your in your UK bank, etc., then that will go bust and then they'll go, oh, don't worry, here's your government uh, wallet um, and here is 10,000 digital pounds. And guess what? I think they'll just use it as a way to just kill cash. Let, they'll let the banks go bust. We'll have a very long bank holiday. It could be like a two week bank holiday. Uh, and then guess what? All and then you have a window way of, of opportunity to, or not opportunity. You have a window where you, you have to hand in all of your pounds and um, pound notes and coins, etc., um, to to get digital sterling in instead. So, uh, Tom, safe, safest of U.S. banks, uh, U.K. banks, cryptos, could be, could be. So that's delinquencies. Um, Go and zoom out even more. Uh, now we need to look at unemployment. So, okay, so here's one thing I want to talk about with unemployment. Um, so again, this is an excerpt from the, the 15 grand Pop-Tart book written a long time ago. Um, this is a huge topic which I could ramble on for days, but in a nutshell, when calculating these figures, they are now purposely stretching the parameters of what a full-time employed person really is. They are now counting people with a part-time job but are seeking a full-time job as fully employed. Naughty, naughty. Uh, they are including some forms of charity slash volunteer workers as fully employed and many other profiles. But they're doing it on the other end of the scale as well, by classing some people without a job but are seeking employment as part-time <laughs> and employed um, and so on. So they're trying to make these figures show that un unemployment isn't as bad as it really is um, when the rich-poor divide is increasing dramatically. Um, and here's the, here's the other thing which um, I didn't put in the book, but when someone is unemployed for a certain period of time, they go off the charts. So I think I, I forgot the, uh, I need to look at the length, but when you are unemployed in the US or and in the UK for a certain period of time, um, they, you, they stop using you as a statistic. And so that's another way they're keeping the figures lower than they really are. Um, it's, it's really cheeky, it really is. So here is the US unemployment rate. This is just nuts. It's it shot up to 15% unemployment. That's, that's everyone, that's of all ages. Um, but guess what? When you look at youth unemployment rate, it's closer to 30%. And so that's 15 to 24 year olds. So what we're basically saying is, you know, roughly 27% of all American youths are unemployed. That is a horrific stat when the, the youth of a nation is the backbone, it is the workforce of a nation. We need our youth to be employed. Um, otherwise, and guess what? It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a death spiral because if the youth aren't working, it means GDP is, is kneecapped. It'll, yeah. So, um, don't know, uh, how will gold hold value uh, in a digital world then? It'll go up. I'm pretty damn sure it will go up. So just hold it. Just, yeah. Uh, because it, by going digital and killing cash, it's just um, showing that the, the the world, that the currency supply or system has just collapsed. Um, and so, yeah, gold, can, yeah, it's just a, it's a great harbour of wealth. So, but yeah, going back to this, unemployment is shooting through the roof. So this is US non-farm payrolls. So this is basically unemployment, um, but not including farms, okay? So yeah, anything non-farm payroll, and we had a massive dip. So it has actually bounced up a bit, um, but again, we're all, we're, everything you're seeing here is the early stages of shit. Um, 
but yeah, it's just not promising. And this is the government. The government is just 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 killing jobs. Um, so look at the government payrolls. So it decreased by fifty-eight thousand five hundred. So they've basically almost cut sixty thousand jobs in America of government um, jobs uh, very recently. So that's that's sixty odd thousand people that are now struggling to pay their rent, mortgage, food, etc. It doesn't. It's just grim. And yeah, initial jobless claims went through the roof. As you can see, it actually came back down. But again, there's lots of stimulus packages out at the moment. So just wait until they expire, and then we'll have helicopter money. Uh, and then look at this. Um, so U.S. continuing jobless claims is going up. So it's basically, um, oh yeah. In fact, this looks quite deceiving when you looking at the bigger picture. So I've had to zoom in here, and you'll see that it, it hit 25 million, and then now it's about 21 million. So what this is basically saying: there's 21 million people claiming that they're jobless uh, from March which is just nuts. 21 million people claiming jobless. They claim, yeah, claiming that they're jobless, which is just insane. And I don't even believe these stats. I think it's a lot higher. Um, so I've, there's a spider in my wall. It started off over there and it's just made it, to, yeah, it's, just, it's quite an active spider. Um, and here's US employed persons. So yeah, um, yeah, obviously if this is going up, the amount of people employed is going down. Um, and I believe this is going to continue going down as my red doodles show. And then, yeah, unemployment is it's just going to keep on going up. Um, and then, this, <laughs> this is, yeah, basically this is total unemployment figures according to the Federal Reserve. Um, and so, yeah, what it's basically, they're all around the same. It's basically saying over 20% of the US workforce is screwed. And this is the U6 figure. So when you're looking at unemployment figures in the US, it's best, or in the UK as well, look at U, U6. So it's, it's, a, it's the broadest, one of the broadest forms of unemployment. So again, I don't trust it. I think that they've screwed up the results by, you know, getting rid of people that have been jobless for more than four years, etc. But it's not, it's not good, guys. And girls, it's not good. Um, so that's unemployment. So where are we? Let's get, zoom back out. So yeah, they are the health metrics. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so you shouldn't really fixate on what what is the stock market doing, because what this event leads to is this. Like you look at all these health metrics and go, oh my God, the economy is, you know, going to hell in a handbasket. Um, yet yeah, what's, what's happening here with stocks? And it's, it's it's just fascinating. In fact, I just want to find this video. Um, uh, where is it? Sorry, Closes. here we go. Um, yeah, it's this one here. Just listen to this. This it's only three minutes long. I met, I met my wife on Match.com. My profile said, I am a medical student with only one eye, an awkward social manner, and $145,000 in student loans. She wrote back, you're just what I've been looking for. She meant honest, so let me be honest. The housing crisis represents the greatest financial opportunity of Making money is not like I thought it would be. This business kills the part of life that is essential the part, the part that, has that has nothing, nothing to do with this so for the past, the past two years, years my insides have felt, felt like they're eating themselves all the, all the people, people i respected won't talk, talk to me anymore except, except through lawyers, lawyers. people want an authority, authority to tell them how to value things they choose, choose this Authority, authority not based, based on, on facts, facts or results. 
they, they choose, choose it because it, because it seems, seems authoritative and familiar, and, familiar. and I'm, I'm not and never, never have, have been familiar. familiar. So, so, so I've come to the, to the sullen realization that I must close, close down for fun. Sincerely, Michael J. Barry, MD. Yeah, that in hindsight, I think this is the wrong video. <laughs> um, but I, I think going back to all all of this, sometimes I feel. I mean, I guess this is a bit of an echo chamber. Everyone here, we are in our own echo chamber, uh, which you have to be completely aware of, and we are somewhat of a bearish echo chamber. Um, yeah, to be to be fair, because I think you know based on what we've seen today and, and, and all sorts of other bits and pieces, I can only be bearish on the health of, of the markets, etc. And what's happening right now, how I personally feel, is that I, I see all of this happening. So I'm looking at all of these health metrics all day long, every day, and all I'm seeing is doom and gloom. And, I, and I'm actively looking for a, a ray of sunshine here, but there isn't. There, there, there really is not. So this is why I'm, I'm so incredibly bearish on the world economy, especially on the macro front, just like Michael Burry was in the big short. And he was basically going underwater for several years, at least three years before his big old shorts came true. Um, but during this time, we had all sorts of rallies and people calling me an idiot, etc. And people were buying stocks at the worst freaking time. Um, like so I think what's happening at the moment is that when you see when when real bad stuff happens in the economy you, you see a disconnect between the health of the economy and also the stock market um, and you see big entities like Hertz you know trying to sell off bankrupt equity to idiots basically um, and you have all sorts of other things like that and and it's basically what the media does like who controls the media? Like, oh no, let's not get into all that. Um, it, yeah, the public will just look at big old news announcements like, oh my God, the market's rallied fifty percent since March, or well, fifty percent, yeah, from the all time or from the local low. But what is it? You know, over over the last ten years, um, <clears throat> the the yeah, it, it is absolutely nuts, and I w I won't be surprised. If we soon see, uh, um, like, like in America, you're probably seeing they're probably seeing you know the Nasdaq is all time highs and everything's been everything's great everything is awesome, um, etc. And in the UK, give it a while, you probably or in fact I've already seen some articles going the, the FTSE has rebounded massively blah blah blah. It's just going to sucker in the the average retail investor. Uh, <laughs> I say that I know I've gone long. <laughs> Uh, but this me is just a, a trade this is not an investment this is me seeing a massive gap down on the FTSE gaps like to be filled in fact you probably go back a few months ago and I was looking at the market here going oh look at this big gap the market will try and fill this guess what the market filled it 100% um, of all gaps uh, from 1950 in all of the stock markets have been filled it's got 100% success rate as in gaps being filled um, so yeah, for me, I'm just going, having a little long to at least close this gap, and I've gone in at what uh, thirty pounds a pip, so thirty pounds a point. But yeah, so don't be fooled by this. Um, and I've showed you that 1929 chart where yeah, 1929 you had six months of rallying, six months of rallying before it toppled over, and I think. Um, let's include it on in this video. So um, Dow Jones 1929 macro trends. Here we go. So for those of you who are not seeing this, let's get rid of the log scale. So look at this. Um, for those who have not seen this before, the Dow Jones, the Dow Jones Industrial Average <coughs> in the US, 
fell off a cliff in 1929. And that is very akin to what we're seeing right now. You know, it's like the Corona crash. And then you had a six, so it bottomed November 20th, um, 1929. And then it, it peaked in April. So what happened is that you had roughly six months of crazy rallying, very similar to what we're, we're looking at right now. So if we, if I just quickly take a screenshot of this. And then compare that to the Dow right now. Where, come on, US 30, where are you? Ignore my scribbles, ignore these. But yeah, this picture is very similar to what um, to what happened over, well, I can't see my pen now. Where's my pen gone? Oh yeah, um, over here. And the public forget things very quickly. They, they really do. So if you have six months of rallying, everyone's going long. Um, now, I know we had a big old drop earlier, but this is still too early to tell. Um, structure hasn't really been broken. I mean, if you're looking at that, um, we're still n not out of the down uh, of the uptrend. Let's have a look at the S&P 500. It's the same picture there. Structure hasn't been broken yet. All we've done is we're, this is just a buying opportunity, actually, as in a short term buy up uh, just to catch the bounce of this this trend line um, and that's all I'm doing you know, look at the the German stock market same thing it's just it's just resting on the 21 EMA at the moment um, and yeah the FTSE same thing so um, in fact just for sh uh, I, I just want to put a limit on at six two nine six two eight nine so I'm just going to quickly put a limit at six two eight nine six two eight nine so yeah, six two eight nine. Yeah, <clears throat> be about six grand trade that. Um, so <laughs> yeah, and my whole account is the stop for this. This is my crash account, so it's my risky account. So hence no stop. But yeah, I'm just I caught that bit too early. I should have waited a bit. Um, but hey ho. So that is <clears throat> that. I'm gonna do another video um, later about buybacks because the main reason for this rally or in fact much much of the the rallying that we've seen um over the last few years has been to, due to corporate buybacks so in a nutshell this corporates buy, borrowing money very cheaply from the market because you've got you know low rates at the moment and all they're doing is just buying back their own stock to up their eps earnings per share up all sorts of other metrics so that the c-suite the corporate you know the the executive suite can just pay themselves big fat dividends and bonuses. So, but yeah, that's a video for another time. We've gone on for 52 minutes already. Um, so yeah, any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. If you have any questions, hit me. It's, it's, it's going, going to accelerate, accelerate this, this depression. depression. I agree. Yeah, I think we're going to go deeper than any sort of depression we've had before. Um, but I don't think it'll be as long. Like if we look at this 1932 crash, like this was long. This is a multi-year um, collapse. So, so yeah, this this took a while. This took a lot longer to happen than what we experienced with the March crash, the March Corona crash. But then from here, all the way down to the ultimate low down here, that's what a two and a half year, somewhat, yeah, almost a two, call it two and a half year um, crash. And this from top of drop to bottom of drop was roughly 87%. So yeah, as, as you've seen with other crashes, things happen a lot faster and a lot quicker. So what I probably see happening is that, that yeah, we could have a rollover at some point. Well, in fact, let's get back onto our actual chart. Um, I still think we, you know, it's going to be end of the year. We'll, we'll see something. We've got, you know, uh, October where that's normally when things happen. We've got the Trump elections. I don't think Trump will let it fall over just yet. Um, but I, I guess we'll probably see more movement, probably pip this one um, and create some sort of topping pattern there's always a topping pattern like a double top head and shoulders or a triple top uh, it won't just go down like this um, but yeah and I think the crash the inevitable the, the eventual crash will be uh, if I go back on the S&P 500 
it could be some somewhere around here and I think it'll be a lot faster uh, so I don't I don't see this being a multi-year um, shitstorm I think we're gonna have a massive um, cutthroat capitulation and then we'll rebound because I am actually really pro um, buoyant and um, enthusiastic about the future if you look at all the exponential text as I mentioned endlessly it's, it's great like I, I think the world's just gonna pivot massively so Mosin what things can what things can we do to take advantage of the recession it's a good question um, and I think the answer is gonna be different for everyone else so for me what I'm doing is I'm battling down the hatches so I actually want to get rid of some of the businesses I do envy those of one business um, life is so much simpler um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm basically going to um, streamline my entities. I want to get, I'm trying to get back down to four businesses, the, the core four as I, as I call them. Um, I would like and I am trying to borrow as much money as possible because it's relatively cheap. I mean, we've got all these um, incentives out there, but I'm also looking at private uh, borrowing on the, on the corporate market or, you know, some sort of bond of some sort. Um, and I... Yeah, I just think the risk to reward ratio um, is quite fortuitous if you know how to deploy capital. So I would not. So for ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the people, I would not recommend getting into more debt. I really wouldn't. But for me, um, I guess one of my skills is capital deployment um, or resource allocation. I guess. Um, so I'm looking to make some moves to effectively leapfrog myself. Um, but again. That is just my nature. I take big swings at things and I miss a lot of the time, but every now and again I connect and that more than overcompensates the, the losers uh, and the amount of losers. So um, I guess in terms of shorting, I think a lot of people are looking at this big old crash to be there. You know, I'm going to make a million bucks from this short. I think what I would highly urge people is that yes, although the market has actually given us another opportunity to really capitalize on, you know, what let's say a 15,000 point drop to come I would not um, I in fact I'm just going to face here because this is going to go out on YouTube eventually um, hello uh, I would not try and treat this as an opportunity to get rich so to speak so let's just say look, for, for example let's just I want to give everyone a reality check okay so it's probably not what you want you it isn't what you want to hear but you need to hear it so let's just say I'm correct okay and we have a move down to this sort of area and for shits and giggles let's just say it's um, uh, let's get so let's move away let's try and find some clear space where we can draw and doodle right got my pen so let's say out of the 15,000 points you're not going to get all of them. So, for example, most people, like, yeah, you could put a positional tr short in, so you could go short now um, <clears throat> at a pound per pip or position size big enough so that even if we breach these highs, you're not going to be margin called. But you, and then you're, you're going to leave it. But most of the time, most people don't get the most of the moves. So what you'll probably find is that, you know, if you're, if you're good, you could probably get half of the move, you know, because people will get scared out. I mean, I've got scared out in loads of these moves um, and I know what I'm doing. So <laughs> so let's just say, you know, you've got a good headwind. You're only going to get seven and a half thousand pips. OK, so oh, that's seven and a half thousand points. Um, that's what you're going to capitalize. Now, let's say you do this nicely and if you can scale in your your orders. So let's say this is the move. It goes down like like so and you exit down here let's say somewhere um, and you get in here what you won't be doing is putting one trade in okay so if you're gonna ladder in you're gonna scale in what you'll end up doing is having you know um, several trades in and then the last few will bomb out but what this means is let's say this trade gets you seven half thousand pips this one could get you six thousand this one will get you five thousand this one will get you four thousand etc so like like with the Black Monday crash where like the market only dropped like a thousand points. I made 20, 25,000 points in that one day because I was laddering in. So let's say you do this, but you don't get as many um, scale-ins. And let's just, I don't know, I'm being really 
positive here because uh, I want to make a point. Let's say you manage to you you manage to bag twenty thousand points from shorting this from God knows how many ladders, blah blah blah. Um, and let's say you have an account size of I don't know, yeah. Let's just say you, you put 10 grand in a crash account. So this 10 grand that you're going to have a punt with, okay? That's very important. So here's the thing. Let's say we're doing it on the S&P and you have, <clears throat> and you want to place a trade and you want to go in at like, I don't know, let's say five pound a point because you think, right, that's, that's nice. Um, but look at this, usable margin, eight thousand, eight and a half thousand. It won't let you place that trade. So what you'll find is that um, <clears throat> if you have 10 grand in your account, it will only let you place a, a position size of roughly half that. So um, you then have to adjust this until this is roughly, call it 5,000. So let's say £2.50. No, will we get away with three quid? No, probably £2. Let's go £2.50 just to be safe. Okay. So all of a sudden, you, you can only place a, a position of £2.50. Um, and that's at the first trade. Now, it, obviously, if the market's going in your favour, then it will increase your mar your your account size. So, um, <clears throat> so let's say you're basically going to get this. What is that? My math is shit. So twenty thousand times two and a half, fifty thousand. Okay. Tax-free profits. So this is what I'm trying to say. Let's say you do have a punt and you put 10 grand in a crash account and it is a punt, a punt account. If you do very well, and as I've said, you've done things great and you've managed to bag 20,000 points, etc. Um, all you're going to end up with is 50K. Okay, that is a lot of money by anyone's um, uh, account, but it's not going to make you a millionaire. So I see a lot of people on YouTube going, oh, you know, you can become a millionaire from this crash. You're not. You're really not. Um, and I want to be the dose of unhappy truth here for you all. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yes, you can 5x your account. Hell, if, you, if you're if you properly aggressive in this and you manage to do this right, you can probably quite easily 10x your account. So, but this is what I'm saying. You're you're only looking at 5, uh, five to 10x of your account. Well, you're actually looking anywhere from 0xing um, to 10xing, if that makes sense, because you could blow your account. Um, I've already blown a crash account since March. Um, so, yeah. So, don't think this is going to change your life. Um, all it is is going to have a nice windfall. Um, and the thing is, you shouldn't treat every crash as like the game changer. Um, or not one method. So what you need to do is lots of methods. So yes, I will be shorting this. So yes, I'll be aiming to 5x or 10x an account from this, etc., or, or more, uh, depending how aggressive I am. But what I'm also waiting for is when we get down here in the capitulation phases, everyone is it's going to be a royal cluster mess. It, like, think of the amount of businesses that will be up for sale for an absolute bargain. <clears throat> like, um, mergers and acquisitions. I, I will be buying stuff up over the next few years. I've paused for now. I'm, I'm not touching anything with the barge pole because one, I'm not clever enough to really know what type of business and business model that will thrive post crash. Uh, I've got a good idea, I think, I think, but no one really knows. Um, <clears throat> like I'm bullish on, you know, things that are congruent that do well in a lockdown environment because I think this is not the first lockdown we're going to get. We're going to get multiple lockdowns. Um, I just think, yeah, I see VR and augmented reality doing well in the future. So those types of businesses are doing well. But really, for me, I'm only interested in businesses that will thrive. I don't care about existing. I want to thrive in a business. So, yeah, once I have a clearer picture in, let's say, a year or two, when, you know, we, we are capitulated, then we'll have a better shout. But I think it's a bit foolish of me to say this is what I'm going to do uh, in 2020 because, yeah, um, your plan goes out the window once you're punched in the face, or however Mike Tyson once said. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Um, yeah, and also another way is just going long on um, Bitcoin and Ether. So I think cryptos will do extremely well. Gold and silver will do extremely well. So I think you need a multi-angled approach. Go long on bullion, go long on crypto, uh, short the markets, um, and then buy land and businesses when the dust is settled. That's my plan. 
at least. Um, except what I'm doing is I'm going to borrow money to exacerbate my, um, yeah, to basically amplify the the wins and also potential losses. But uh, and another thing which actually <clears throat> is a bit counterintuitive is that I'm also borrowing money for the businesses to massively increase marketing. So what a lot of people fail when during crashes or businesses is that oh my god everyone's crashing the market's crashing businesses are going bust and they they try and tighten up their purse strings but they tighten up the wrong strings they stop marketing they see that as a as a gross waste but it's wrong if you know how to create a marketing um, uh, engine or machine uh, that's when you need to be doubling down so during all of I've already started <clears throat> uh, I'm spending about. 25 grand a month on uh, Facebook ads at the moment so and the goal for me my personal goal is I want to be spending a hundred grand a month on Facebook uh, because what's gonna happen is that everyone's disappearing from marketing which means I'll be able to gobble up a bigger market share for my businesses so yeah I hope yeah so hopefully that makes sense um, uh, what are my core so most is asking what are my core for businesses if you don't mind me asking so I've got a marketing company the realistic trader the wealth action plan and a corporate management training business um, so yeah that's the long story so yeah any other questions at all feel free to unmute yourself pop them in the chat box I'm here hit me If not, we'll call this an end. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the bot had a bit of a, a tumble recently, um, but it looks like things are popping up in the right direction now, so that's interesting. Um, so yeah, we've gone flat on my safe bot, but yeah. Um, anything else? In a, okay, here we go. Uh, in a crash, how correlated do you think Bitcoin and Ether will be? Correlated to what? Mark. So, oh, to equities, yeah. So, um, what I see happening, and it happened, uh, in fact, if we get my trading view open, go away. So, if we look at um, the SP 500, come on, SPX, there we go. And then we overlay Bitcoin. So, because of all the derivatives and how the world, the mark, oh dear, this is not showing it properly. Here we go. That's a bit better. So, <clears throat> cryptos and the the current um, and the stock market are very much um, correlated at the moment. As you can see here, we had equities tump. So let's move on to the daily chart. Maybe that would be clearer. <clears throat> there we go. It's pretty much one for one. Um, I would say there's what an eighty percent correlation there so yeah the these candle bars are the S&P 500 this um, but uh, in fact let's just make this um, make it black let's make it thick um, there we go so and this black line is Bitcoin so as you can see um, equities or in fact actually it looks like <laughs> Bitcoin actually tumbled first but either way um, everything's following <clears throat> stocks that's crashed Bitcoin crashed we've had the the, the suckers rally the stim pump um, and guess what look stocks fall guess what Bitcoin falls like they're, they're so interlinked because Wall Street is getting their grubby hands in involved and so what I see happening is that when stock like eventually when stocks can start to roll over again like I've been saying over here crypto will fall <clears throat> fall with it temporarily I, I really believe that I think they're gonna um, go in lockstep just like it has done just like it has over here and then there'll be the disconnect I don't know when the disconnect will, will be but what will happen is if I can annotate let's do a big blue so I think you know this will continue going down this will go down with it temporarily and then we're gonna have the disconnect where Bitcoin will literally something will be shoved up under his ass its ass and it will go nuts whilst this 
continues to do that. Um, and so I don't know where the crossing will happen, um, but I, I, I think you need to start um, accumulating now. So I've put a fifth of my crypto pop into Ether. Oh, by the way, I wouldn't even go into Bitcoin. I, I'd look at Ether. Um, I think Ether is massively undervalued compared to Bitcoin at the moment. So if we look at Ether, Bitcoin, here we go. <clears throat> Let's get rid of this comparison. So this is, um, if we look at the weekly chart, there we go. So <clears throat> this is basically showing the value of Ether against Bitcoin on the weekly chart going back to 2018. And as you can see, it is, it's really, really gone down. So what I see happening is um, Ether making its way all the way back up here at least. Um, so yeah, personally, I want to be in Ether and Bitcoin, but um, I'm going to use Ether to make sure I get as much Bitcoin as possible. So I'm, I'm really, I'm gonna build up a, 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 um, a position in the ether around these levels. I do see another dip coming. I think it'll be probably the last dip we'll see. I think very soon, I think we may have another dip below 10,000, but what I think we're getting towards the stages that we'll, we won't see $10,000 for a long freaking time. So I wanna get in around this sort of area here uh, and then wait, uh, uh, yeah and try and exit into Bitcoin up here or maybe beyond because all the big boys like the Wall Street, they're, they're using Ether, um, you know, because for the smart contracts. Um. <clears throat> so when do you think the market will crash? No idea. Um. What ratio? What ratio? Are you, um, I mean, I, mean, I, 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 think, I think I've asked this question a few times, times and I'm not really clear. Really clear. Uh, Habib, Habib says 80% Bitcoin, 20% Ether. And I was wondering what ratio you're, you're going in at. Huh. You said it before, then I, I, I No, no. <clears throat> See, it, it's personal preference. It really is. Um, I'm 100%. I'm going to. Oh, shit. No. I'll. Pr mm. At the moment, as it stands, I'm, I'm leaning towards 100% Ether. Um, that's all, that's I'm, all holding I'm holding at the moment, but it's obviously it's, uh, simply because of this. Yeah, like I think, I think any money I put into bit Bitcoin, even though every bone of me wants some Bitcoin, it means that I'm losing out on more Bitcoin in the future. So I'm not doing future Siam a favor by doing that. So I, you know, always do yourself a do your future self a favor is my mantra. Um, and so I want to do f future Siam a favor. Um, by having the you know um, yeah i, I want to go all in on ether simply because of this ratio here this this ether will claw back ground uh, against bitcoin eventually and it will at least get back to these uh, levels you really you really think it will match the level, level it had in 2018 the same ratio yeah um, yeah. The reason I question that is because Bitcoin, we, see, we know it's inefficient, it's, it's, it's expensive to mine, it's blah, 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 blah. <coughs> but um, it's, digital it's digital gold, gold. whereas Ether, Ether, as you said the other day, it's okay, okay it's, it's all right, right. I mean, it's, it's much, much more efficient, efficient it's much better than Bitcoin in terms of usability, but um, why? Yeah, I'm still there. But, but it's not it's ideal, ideal there, you know, there are far better, more far more efficient cryptos, crypto, so it's kind of a, kind of a first, first step in the more, more efficient crypto, but is it, is it is you really, it's not exactly, not exactly the future of cryptos, crypto, is it? No. Bitcoin isn't the future, Ether isn't the future. Um, mentioned, I think, in a previous video, the, f the future of a crypto, it has to buy the absolute basics needs to be a DAG uh, directed to cyclic graph. So it has unlimited scalability, unlimited transaction issues, um, <clears throat> and it, Ether and Bitcoin are none, none of them. But yeah, I do believe Ether will claw back that ground against Bitcoin simply because Wall Street are now... So the boom here is basically big capital flowing into crypto, i.e. Wall Street. Um, Wall Street and London and family offices and billionaires, etc. And they're not going to be dicking around with little... You know things on page two of coin market cap or anything below spot 10 on coin market cap um, and all of the the big boys that are doing uh, projects like um, contact tracing you know corona tracing type stuff uh, I proof of ID stuff um, any form of identity stuff they're, they're building it on top of ether I think the last time I checked um, they're closing in on a million developers for ether um, so for, for Ethereum, um, so when you look at the amount of developers 
that can code in the crypto world, um, they're all focusing on um, on the Ethereum language. Uh, so yeah, basically anyone that's building anything, any sort of project right now, they're they're really backing it. They they're using Ethereum as the base ground level work groundwork, so to speak. Um, so yeah, but as I said, this is just a personal preference thing. Don't copy me. If you want to be safe, go 50-50. Um, or okay, okay. if you want to be even safer, you know, <clears throat> have a, you know, 25% in Bitcoin, 25% in Ether, and then the, the other 50% spread across the top 10, 20 um, on coin ma market cap. Or even I do the- I think I'm almost, almost entirely, almost entirely Bitcoin Ether and Bitcoin is what I'll do. I fancied a punt on Energy Web after what you said the other day, but uh, obviously after things, things start to crash a bit. Yeah, uh, um, I'm not. I don't think I'm that bothered, bothered about, about the others, others really. Maybe Monero. Maybe Monero a little, a little yeah, bit. current uh, privacy currencies will, will do very well, uh, especially in a world yeah. of um, uh, yeah lockdowns with capital and all that sort of stuff. So oh, right. cool. yeah, cool. Thanks. No, that's right. Um, any questions on what we covered today, or shall we call it a day? Going in three. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, I was just going to ask, do you think this, you, you said the scale, all the way it's going to happen is much faster. Mm -hmm. um, do you think this, think this will be the same kind of level of depression, of depression and kind of how hard it's going to hit to get, to get, the, time to get the time duration just in terms of the, level, <coughs> the, scale, of the scale of it as 1930s? Do you also think this is one of the big cycle crashes coming in or one of the smaller cycles? I mean, this is a major one, isn't it? Yeah, in my personal opinion, I could be wrong, but everything I'm looking at is showing stuff like all when you look at the health metrics again i i focus on the health metrics because um there is a lag um between the actual health of economy and the stock market um <clears throat> all these health metrics absolutely dick over the what happened in 2001 2007 1987 uh, 1966 like all like the only thing that comes close to what's happening right now is 1929 um and so yeah as a, 2008, I felt could have been, but they just, as you said, kicked the can down the road. And it just feels like it's yeah. just one step, one step too many. many. Yeah, <clears throat> and you just have to be completely aware of this. Property prices, stock market prices are not an indicator an indicator of economic health. So, yeah, okay, and, and at this, right. Thanks, right. yeah, that's right. And at the same time, what this also means is that if economic health hits rock bottom, it also doesn't mean that stock prices hit rock bottom. What you'll actually find is that they they are somewhat lagged by each other. So yeah, you also have to be aware of that. So actually, stock prices. In fact, I've drawn this incorrectly, but stock prices will, will tend to bounce before um, we we get to the actual low. So, <clears throat> but yeah, I'll have to find another chart on that. But anyway, yeah, let's yes, yeah, been an hour and twenty roughly. Um, so Rob, thanks, Simon. By the way, the GMI report from Raul Powell was an interesting read. Yeah, that that, that is, he's he's a good egg. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. And um, I'm going to use this framework in future. So these are the health indicators. So this is just going to be the first video. I think future videos, I want to keep them under 20 minutes. <laughs> but um, yeah, right. Good luck, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I struggle with timekeeping. Cool. Have a good one all. Nice, 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 nice. Chat with you all soon. Toodles. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks, bye bye. Thanks, bye, -bye.